Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Praise him with the crash of the cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This is The Righteous by Jambo, and it's time to talk about the golden age of gospel. It's inevitable in the curatorship of any music collection to divide music into genres and to look for the points of demarcation or differentiation which separate one music from the next across those genre lines. Just look at the bewildering selection of genres and subgenres which are apparent in hip hop and heavy metal. Somehow, terms like genre-defying and genre-defining nowadays so liberally applied to artists seem, well, kind of generic. But one of the more obviously definitive genres which needs to be addressed and curated appropriately in some record collections is gospel music. It's also one of the worst defined because like jazz, the present has not been kind with the legacy it was left. What we know is gospel music evolved from the rigorization of spirituals, songs born deep in the horrors of slavery. After the Reconstruction, African American music went through a period of great expansion and evolution, driven by the growth of black churches and holy rolling preachers, who encouraged a far more energetic and emotional congregation, and allied spirituals to syncopated and spontaneous rhythms. Black churches had no issues, generally, with choirs singing with accompaniment, so organs, pianos, brass and percussion all came into the mix. While the churches predominantly in the south were getting hot, in the north in the postbellum period, the most popular trends in black music were going in the opposite direction as a group of students trying to raise funds for Fisk University in Nashville formed a troupe which toured for many years singing traditional spirituals a cappella in a very formalised setting, almost as a reaction to the cruel farce that was the dying minstrel show circuit. What evolved this was not unlike barbershop quartet music, which grew from it. Very formal, very defined roles, and thus the way gospel music stayed for almost 50 years. It wasn't until the early 1930s when one of the few genuine geniuses of American music, Thomas A. Dorsey, became the music master of the Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago. Dorsey, while an accomplished musician, wasn't a genius in the mould of, say, Duke Ellington or Jimi Hendrix, he was possessed of the peculiar American genius for spotting a niche in the marketplace and developing and exploiting a product to meet it. Dorsey was also one thing an American audience loves the most, a sinner turned penitent. Although his motives were absolutely sincere, you see, Dorsey had been one of the most successful hokum blues singers and composers from the mid-twenties to the early thirties. Hokum was a very sexually suggestive form of the blues, relying on insinuation and double entendre to make its ribald or humorous point, and his 1928 debut with Tampa Red, its tight like that, as featured in TRB 21, had made Dorsey a comfortable living. But tragedy struck when he lost his wife and daughter in childbirth in 1931. During his grief, he wrote Precious Lord Take My Hand, one of the most recorded gospel songs of honour, a favourite of Martin Luther King, who sang it at the rally the night before he was killed, and Lyndon Johnson, who had it sung at his funeral. Dorsey's commercial instincts soon kicked in and he developed a unique compositional style which merged the lyrical themes of the spirituals, updated to contemporary reference and the musical stylings of jazz and blues, resulting in frequently fast tempo or syncopated songs. These proved tremendously popular. Dorsey invested in his own music publishing company to get a better deal for gospel songwriters and later black songwriters in general and began block booking radio time on powerful transmitter stations to beam his songs far and wide. So 
ubiquitous did the new styles of songs become that any song recorded in that style or of that ilk became simply known as a Dorsey. His song Peace in the Valley is almost instantly synonymous with Elvis Presley. In fact, so deeply in the national culture did Dorsey's music and vision penetrate that he was the first African-American songwriter to be inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. Ironically, due to his later association with Fisk University, whose musical traditions his songs had almost single-handedly destroyed. Soon, groups like the Golden Gate Jubilee Quartet were incorporating Dorsey's ideas as far as they could go into the old style and the soul stirrers were using them to abolish it. The golden age of gospel was at hand and here are 12 songs that absolutely encapsulate that wonderful time up there. Number 12, You Can't Hurry God by Dorothy Love Coates. A major inspiration on Wilson Pickett. Coates wrote the gospel version of 99 and a Half Won't Do, which Pickett secularised and turned into a hit. The unassuming Coates took her remarkably down-to-earth persona and her raggedy voice, and not only became one of the funkiest singers on the hard gospel scene in the 1950s, she became an enduring influence on the likes of Mavis Staples, Little Richard, and the aforementioned Wicked One. Number 11, Getaway Jordan by the Statesman Quartet. Jake Hess, lead singer of the Statesman, was a huge influence on Elvis Presley. Old Elvis loved him so much he never stopped adding tributes to his style, and not only did he record with Hess, Hess was actually invited to sing at Elvis's funeral, turning in a lonesome known only to him. Number 10, I Can See Everybody's Mother, The Blind Boys of Alabama. There has been a Blind Boys of Alabama since the late 1930s, right up to now and they still have two of the original five. The Blind Boys have always mixed a raucous gospel style with onstage hijinks and jokes. For example, the lead singer went on a crowd walk during their set when I saw them, delving back to the spirituals and hollers or updating modern spiritual classics. They've worked with Lou Reed, they're in the Gospel Hall of Fame, and they sang the theme song to the greatest television show ever. Number nine, The Atomic Telephone. The Spirit of Memphis Quartet. One of the more specialised kinds of music I favour is a strange assemblage of gospel, country music and R&B shouters recorded in the late 40s to mid 50s, which dealt specifically with the perils of atomic power, communism and, oddly, going to the moon. No doubt there'll be a video of just such music one day. This one sits nicely in that intersection of the atomic and gospel sets. Another favourite of Elvis Presley, the Spirit of Memphis Quartet, was a constantly rotating roster of singers. And when, on August 14th, 1951, when they laid this down, the great Jet Bledsloe was the lead tenor. It's an unusual song, claiming atomic energy had both enough might to power a telephone all the way to heaven, I don't think they know how telephones work, for no charge, I don't think they know how telecommunications corporations work either, or to destroy the earth and cleanse it of all evil. So it's a win-win. Number eight, man can't get no satisfaction, the mighty clouds of joy. Undisputable superstars of gospel and perhaps the last great hard gospel group to emerge being founded in 1961. Led by the storming Joe Ligon, a devotee of the great Julius Cheeks of the Sensational Nightingales, the Clouds were the flashiest, most rock and roll group on the circuit for 15 years. Influencing Wilson Pickett and James Brown, think of the Blues Brothers there, in the process. Again, the song seems to echo 50s and 60s gospel's obsession with the space race. We've proven our wickedness by landing on the moon, but we'll still be driven by hubris and lust until we put a man on Mars. Marvellous, if slightly mental stuff. Number seven, Make Room in the Lifeboat for Me by Howard Surratt. When Johnny Cash turned up on Sam Phillips' doorstep at Sun singing gospel songs, Phillips supposedly told him to go home and do some sinning and come back with a song I can sell. Some may have said that was a gutsy move on Phillips' part, turning away one of the genuine titans of American music, but he knew Cash wouldn't sell singing gospel and he knew this because he had Howard Surratt. Unheralded as Surratt may have been, there's a calm and plaintive sincerity in his voice which I like a great deal. Number six, See How They Done My Lord by the Sensational Nightingales. 
Julius Cheeks was one of the most influential singers, not just within gospel, but in the gospel come soul vocalists. And his style typified the rough and ragged style of gospel's 50s golden age. Cheeks was famed amongst gospel singers for the degree to which he pushed his voice to the limit every song, every night, and for the flexibility of his instrument, which impacted the style of singers from Sam Cooke, with whom he briefly worked in the Soul Stirrers, to Don Covey and Evie Floyd, and even the great Otis Redding. Number five, Jesus Gonna Hit Like the Atom Bomb, The Pilgrim Travelers. Another nuclear-powered soul saver, this song is an update of Charming Bells' 1949 original. The Travelers were a staple on the gospel scene from their inception in 1936 to the late 1950s, when they lost prominence after Lou Rawls left the group. Rawls had been Sam Cooke's protege, shadowing in both the Highway QCs and the Soul Stirrers. The pre-Cook Soul Stirrers recorded this themselves shortly after The Travellers in a faster-paced, more R&B-leaning version. The Travellers' baritone on this record, Jesse Whittaker, was one of Ray Charles' major influences, and Nick Cave covered their song Jesus Met the Woman at the Well for his Kicking Against the Pricks album in 1986. Number four, strange things are happening every day. Sister Rosetta Farmer. A contender for the first rock and roll record ever, this was the first gospel song to cross over to a pop chart, making number two on the Billboard R&B chart in early 1945. It rocks, it rolls, it's down and it's dirty. And if it was to be the first rock and roll record, I have an opinion that says it isn't, but that's for another video, then rock and roll could have no better first rock star than Sister Rosetta. A tough, throaty voice that got better with age, she wasn't a shouter, she had more of a nightclub singer's approach to the mic. And she was indisputably a red-hot guitar player. She opened up for Muddy Waters on his 1964 tour of England, a tour which had tremendous influence on any number of emerging British blues players, and she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Muddy every night. Jeff Beck was quoted as saying he found Sister Rosetta's playing more inspiring than anyone in Mud's band. Now, don't quote me, but I think he had Muddy Guy in the band on that tour. Her recording of Down by the Riverside from 1944 is in the Library of Congress for its historical significance, but it could get there for its guitar solo alone. She died too young at 58 from the complications of diabetes. Number three, The Bedside of a Neighbour, The Dixie Hummingbirds. The second oldest group on this list, forming in South Carolina in 1928, the birds are probably also the most commercially successful, recording Loves Me Like a Rock and Tenderness on Paul Simon's second solo album and winning a Grammy for Loves Me Like a Rock. This jaunty number about the last moment before a friend dies features the great Ira Tucker, who was a model for the vocal style and spectacular stagecraft of perhaps the most unfairly disregarded soul singer of all time in Jackie Wilson, on a lead with a relatively restrained performance, check out a song called The Christian Automobile to hear Tucker sing at full tilt and the mighty Willie Bobo singing the bass part with the cruelly underrated Howard Carroll playing a genuinely rocking guitar solo which is as lyrical as it is funky. If you're further curious as to just what a great vocalist Tucker was, check out their 1946 version of Amazing Grace which is also a pretty good example of the older flatfoot style of Jubilee. The Dixie Hummingbirds are one of America's great groups, a constant heartbreed across three generations with a legacy that can be weighed with the far more illustrious and famous groups from the rock and roll era. Number two, Jezebel by the Golden Gate Quartet. Starting out in Norfolk, Virginia in 1934, the Golden Gate Quartet became superstars of gospel by the time America had ended World War II. Powered by a trio of remarkable lead vocalists, Henry Owens, the baleful second tenor whose blues-inflected voice harked back most directly to the spiritual tradition, the velvety smooth Willie Langford, who also possessed a keen falsetto, and his replacement, the dynamic Clyde Riddick, who spent the best part of 60 years with the group. While their most famous baritone was the Mills Brothers influenced Biggie Smalls of the 1930s, the Jive Talkin' Willie Johnson. The evolution of the Golden Gate Quartet's music is a direct mapping of the evolution of gospel 
from the more formal pre dorsey style to the doorstep of hard gospel which had dominated the golden era. They appeared in several big Hollywood films, delved into folk and social commentary, recorded with the likes of Louis Armstrong and made a string of classic recordings, including 1938's John the Revelator, which is in the Library of Congress and got them invited to John Hammond's Epoch Defining Spirituals to Swing concert, the original Midnight Special with Lead Belly, Coming In on a Wing and a Prayer, Atom and Evil, another one of those atomic gospel songs I like so much, and I believe it's B-side that Johnny Cash favoured God's Gonna Cut You Down. As the Golden Age hotted up, the quartet found itself unable to compete with the slicker, more R&B-leaning quartets and quintets. Number one, I'm going to build on that shore by the Soul Stirrers. Sam Cooke was arguably the greatest male pop and soul singer of all time. He was, inarguably, however, the greatest male gospel singer of all time. Formed in 1926 in Texas, the Soul Stirrers were innovative from the start, employing a lot more blues and R&B devices than other groups, especially in their trademark lead singers where two tenors would trade lines, each building on the emotional intensity of the last. It also meant that the Soul Stirrers could operate as a five-piece and still maintain the strict and quartet format. They started using more syncopated rhythms, busier and more intense use of backing vocalists, and abandoning the rigid harmonic roles in Jubilee into a mode where individual singers could sing out more expressively and in a more extemporal style. When Cook joined in 1950, though, they went to another level. With his movie star good looks, confident manner, and supreme command of a voice which was both honey and sandpaper, he not only raised the bar for emotional commitment and sincerity in gospel, but for pop singing in general. This record really isn't Cook's show though. Roy Crane, the founder of the Soul Stirrers, handles the verses in his seasoned and flexible baritone, although he sails up into mid-tenor with ease. While Cook stokes the fire and then fans the flames with his impassioned chorus, giving us the mere hint of what he was later to develop into a devastating melisma. Why does every talent show contestant or talent show contestant sound like pop singer these days seem to feel the need to demonstrate a wobbly, overblown melisma? Is, perversely, Sam and his brilliantly weaponized melisma somehow to blame for this? A final thought on I'm going to build on that shore and the golden age of gospel in general. It comes from a time when gospel music was fresh, authentic, made a valid and influential contribution to the musical corpus and was fun to listen to. Compare and contrast with the travesty and dreck that represents for gospel music these days. Sam Cooke had soul. Today's gospel singers sound like two-year-olds tantruming at the candy rack in the checkout aisle. It's like the late and much lamented in these parts Hank Hill once said, you're not making Christianity any better, you're just making rock and roll worse. Guten Morgen, meine Freunde. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. Let's begin by addressing the rather large and unsubtle elephant in the room, the absence of Mahalia Jackson from the presentation. Um, it's down to a matter of personal taste, I guess. I always found while Mahalia has a inarguably magnificent voice, she's a wonderful singer. Her records were always just a little too um, pristine and clean sounding. For my personal taste, I prefer the raggedy voice singers like Dorothy Love Coates or Sister Winona Carr. So I hope that goes some way to offering some mitigation to the no doubt outraged legions of Mahalia Jackson's fans. Um, the same story really for Elvis Presley. Um, he dressed gospel music up just a little too much and I, I prefer the shouters and the stompers and the and the screamers. So uh, your opinions on that list and the playlist that's provided with us. I'd be terribly, terribly, terribly keen to know what those opinions were. So leave them in the comments below. Leave a like, do a subscribe, do whatever you feel. It's Mardi Gras day. And just remember that you'll never know where you're at until you know where you've been.
I, I tend, tend to prefer, prefer the more raggedy sounding gospel, gospel singers like Dorothy Love Coates or. Oh, what's her name? Uh, she, she did Life, Life is Like a Ball, ball Game. game. Um, good, good friend of her, Jackson. What's her name? Life is like a ball game. Sister, 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 sister. 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 Sister, sister.